It's eight o'clock in Geneva. So greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the preparatory webinar this morning. Welcome everyone to the preparatory webinar on involving breeders in the US examination. The objective of this prep webinar is to enhance the participation of experts at the technical working parties, providing basic information about key aspects of operating the WAP system. The program for today is we have a series of presentations from the colleagues from Australia, France, Japan, and New Zealand. In the second part of this webinar, we'll also uh, receive presentations from colleagues from Argentina and Canada. This presentation starts with an introduction and followed by the presentations from experts and will be completed with a session on questions and answers. As an introduction to our discussions today, we would like to recall you UPOP guidance on arrangements for the US testing, which has been agreed by UPOP members and is contained in document TGP6. In particular, a couple of sections, such as the examples for arrangements for the US testing, where different UPOP members share their experiences in how they organize the US testing, in particular involving the collaboration of plant breeders to different uh, extents. And also section three on a declaration for the conditions for the examination of the US that is based on or carried out by uh, breeders themselves. The legal basis for cooperating with breeders comes from the convention itself. As in article 12 of the 1991 Act of the Convention, it is, expressly stated that the authority may grow the variety itself, which is often referred to as centralized testing, but also the authority may cause the growing of the variety. And to cause the growing of the variety, several modalities can be used. The authorities may collaborate with other independent institutes or the individual breeders uh, themselves or an organization acting on be behalf of the breeders. Of course, the authorities are also very welcome to take over test reports to reduce the repetition of work. But specifically looking at cooperation with breeders, cooperating with breeders is, is of utmost importance because it maximizes the use of all available information as breeders have most of the information you could possibly wish to have in a particular for any given crop. It also minimizes the time required for DUS examination, speeding up the rate of delivery of uh, titles, and also can provide access to the breeders' resources. Breeders often have facilities or expertise or variety collections that would be relevant for DUS examination and tapping into these specialist resources is also beneficial for DUS examination. But it's important to recall that cooperation with breeders is important for the testing phase of the US examination and should often should always be in con under control of the authority and the decision on whether a variety is to be considered distinct, uniform, and stable should always rely on the authority. So it's the authority who will be in control and who will take a final decision on the US. If you'd like to read more about what I've just mentioned, the documents are available from the UPOP website, Cooperation with Breeders, in particular, documents TGP6, Section 2, on examples of arrangements for DOS testing, where you can read about how Australia, France, Japan, and Switzerland organized their DOS examination, and also in document TGP6, Section 3, there's a declaration on the conditions for examination conducted under the, the breeder's supervision or at the breeder's premises. But here there's guidance on cooperation with breeders in DUS examination. The documents are available from the UPOV website. Please look up on the UPOV system tab from where you should select TGP documents. And from there, you're gonna have access to the entire list of TGP documents, including those TGP documents I've previously mentioned.
Now, moving on to the first presentation in our preparatory webinar today, we would like to invite our first guest speaker, the colleagues from Australia, Ms. Edwina Vanden, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, if you could just bring up my slides. Thank you. So uh, my name is Edwina van Dyne. I'm the Chief of Plant Breeders' Rights at the PBR office in Australia. Uh, next slide, please. The Australian PBR office is part of the Australian Government Department, IP Australia, uh, which is responsible for administering PBR patents, trademarks and design. So today I'll explain, um, I'll give you some information about the DUS trial process in Australia. But first I'll provide some, co some context to explain why Australia has implemented the processes that we have. So we have a total of seven PBR examiners and receive approximately 350 applications per year and have received a total of 11,000 applications, um, covering a wide range of genera and species. As part of the application process, all varieties must undergo a comparative trial in Australia or the applicant can rely on data from an overseas test report um, if that's available and if it does satisfy the Australian legislative requirements. Next slide, please. So Australia is a fairly large country. Um, as you can see, uh, whilst there's a lot of land use that's non-agriculture, um, mostly general grazing areas, there are widespread areas of strong agriculture use. To be honest, this map on the left doesn't quite do justice. If I could, you could zoom in and you can actually see the speckles of um, agriculture use all throughout the country. Um, and then on the right, you can see that there's an extreme, extreme range in climate across um, Australia. For example, winter cereals are grown from temperate regions um, right up to the subtropical region. So if Australia was to mandate um, that all trials were conducted at a centralised testing centre, where would they be best placed? Yes, you could use internally controlled environments, but here's the next challenge. Next slide, please. Australia has very strict biosecurity restrictions, making it very difficult to transport plant material, um, not just between states, but even within states. This makes setting up a centralised testing centre where all species can be sent for trials very difficult. Additionally, as you saw before, we do have a fairly small team of highly skilled examiners, but they cannot, like, we can't afford them to be subject matter experts um, in all of the species across all our applications. Next, thanks. So to address these challenges, Australian legislation was designed to enable the PBR office to accredit experts who can assist applicants in undertaking the DUS trial. These experts are called qualified persons and I'll refer to these as QPs. To become a QP, a person applies to the PBR office. They outline the species that they are seeking accreditation for and provide evidence of their relevant experience. The office assesses the, the candidate's suitability and requires them to undertake the self-paced online training program. The QP can nominate to be a consultant QP. Generally, these are independent individuals who provide QP services to anyone wishing to use them. Whereas a non-consultant QP is usually employed within an applicant's business and generally only provides QP services to that applicant. They may be the breeder or they may be another technical expert. IP Australia provides contact details of consultant QPs on their website so that it's accessible to applicants. Uh, the great benefit of this system is that, as you can see from the chart here, uh, we have QPs um, that are available all across Australia, making access, making access to them um, quite easy for applicants, no matter where the trial be conducted. Next slide, thanks. So, under Australian legislation, all applications for a PBR must nominate a QP. The QP is responsible for engaging with the PBR office to formalise a trial plan, determining the most similar variety of common knowledge to be included in the trial, overseeing the trial, collecting the data from the trial, and preparing and submitting the detailed description of the variety to the PBR office. Next slide, thanks. So once the trial plan is agreed to by the QP and the PBR office, the QP and applicant work together to complete the trial. The trial location is decided upon by them 
and can be held at the applicant's premise, the QP's premise, or a centralised testing centre. So a, test, a centralised testing centre in Australia is not uh, part of um, the PBR office. Uh, it's accredited by the office, but it's not associated with us. Um, and it can be an independent business. To be accredited, a CTC, Centralised Testing Centre, sorry, must have vast experience in PBR DUS trials and be a well-established facility. Applicants who use a CTC may be entitled to reduced examination fees. This is because it can save the PBR office costs as, they are, as the CTC is usually running multiple trials um, at once and we can examine those simultaneously. Next slide, thanks. So the requirements of a DUS trial. The trial must conform to the usual scientific standards and use UPOV test guidelines where they are available. The trial must include the closest varieties of common knowledge and each variety in the trial must be grown under identical conditions. The use of reference data is not considered reliable as it's unlikely that observations recorded in the reference data were obtained from a trial that would be identical to the one that's been undertaken for the current candidate. Next slide, thanks. So once a trial is ready for examination, the QP must notify the PBR office. An examiner will make an assessment on whether they need to attend the trial in person. They base this assessment on a couple of criteria. Um, for example, the QP's experience with the species, the differences that were claimed in the initial application. Um, but in most cases, the examiner will attend the trial along with the QP, but they will make independent observations. The QP is responsible for submitting the description and the examiner compares their field observations with the information supplied in the description. Um, if there are any discrepancies, re-examination may, may be required or another trial may need to be conducted. Next slide, thanks. Um, so role of the QP uh, for overseas data. So if an applicant requested to rely on overseas uh, dust trial data, that's generally straightforward. Um, the overseas trial must be conducted in line with the relevant TGs. It must include the most similar varieties of common general knowledge and of common knowledge, sorry, and the information must satisfy Australian legislation. The applicant is still required to use the services of a qualified person and once obtained from the overseas authority, a copy of that DUS report is provided to the QP. Um, part of their role is to ensure that the most similar variety was included in the trial um, and then they can go ahead and prepare the description. If the overseas report won't be available for, uh, let's say more than six months, we generally ask the QP to provide a trial plan to the PBR office so that we can identify any issues um, early in the process and hopefully there's time to readjust the trial if necessary. Cool. So when applying for, the P when applying for PBR, um, the examination fee must be paid to the PBR office regardless of whether the trial is conducted in Australia or overseas. However, the cost of a QP services and the trial itself is the responsibility of the applicant. Any associated fees for obtaining an overseas test report are also the responsibility of the applicant. Next slide, thanks. Thank you. And this is the last slide. Um, so some may question the rigour of breeder testing due to perceived conflicts of interest. However, the Australian process is robust and transparent. Whilst a breeder could also become a qualified person, there are also legal ramifications if they falsify information. It's also in their best interest um, that they are getting a robust right. The qualified person is an expert in the species that is the subject of the application and are integral to ensuring the integrity of the Australian PBR system. As I mentioned before, they must undertake a training program conducted by the PBR office and be accredited by the PBR office. Examiners typically attend um, most Australian trials in person to verify the reported data and descriptions, whether they be um, based on Australian data or an overseas trial, are published in a journal. Before the PBR can be granted by an examiner, the public must be given six months after the description is published to raise any objections. Less than 1% of, of applications receive any objections. And I think that demonstrates the effectiveness of the, making that final decision to grant the right as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Edwina. We would now continue on to our second guest speaker today from France, Ms. Valérie Uteva. Please, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Valérie Uteval. I work in France at Jerez office and I manage the DUS exam for maize and sorghum. And also I manage the registration of maize and sorghum varieties on the national listing. And thank you. So in France, we use um, a system named uh, Breeders Participation System, BPS, since uh, early uh, to, uh, 2000, and uh, the system is limited to maize. Uh, the system is uh, voluntary basic, so breeders may choose to participate or not participate on the, uh, the US exam. And uh, this option is uh, limited to accredited companies. Um, we uh, change uh, some, uh, some activities on the BPS system. We have a new design since uh, 2017. So now, during the first year, tests are conducted on the GVS premises on two different locations and in parallel in the breeder um, trials. So we can see uh, uh, the map of uh, France and the three um, locations who are um, shown the US trial by GVS. Uh, the aim of BPS is to secure and to accelerate the DUS test uh, in addition to GVS DUS trial to possibly enable li listing in one year. So we can change, please. So um, the activity during the first years uh, to have a possible uh, decision on D, U, and S at the end of the first years. So uh, we uh, would have obligation, uh, applicant statement in the application file to use BPS to start at the beginning, supplied seed sample uh, of the variety, and in addition, six euros for the inbreed line. Because in France, we, we use um, uh, ear rows. Uh, it's uh, self-pollinated for inbred line to uh, observe the uniformity and stability assessment. Uh, statement uh, of the applicant location of trial before the 1st April for each variety who uh, BPS system is used. Uh, statement of most similar variety in the application is possible. The US observation uh, are uh, carried out in two GVS location by GVS, um, by the staff of GVS. Um, uniformity and stability and distinctness observation are carried out. And in parallel, the US observation in one applicant's location carried out by applicant staff and the staff is trained and accredited. The staff make a description and uniformity assessment on the varieties and on the most similar varieties peers indicated uh, in the application. At the end of the first years, we used uh, Gaia software. So I present Gaia uh, yesterday. And uh, we use Gaia with our data, with only JVS data, to search the most similar varieties into the reference collection to be compared side by side in second years. So at the end of the first years, if uh, all uh, elements uh, are uh, agreed to say that uh, the variety is uh, uniform, stable, and distinctness, we can say uh, we can take a positive report. But if we have um, a doubt or if it's necessary, we can continue in second years. And in second years, uh, observation are carried out only by GVS in the GVS lo location. So, uh, 
you can change, please. We have uh, a protocol recommendment for, for this system. Uh, builder company must be accredited. Uh, the staff of the company must be accredited also. So we organize an uh, exam to, um, uh, to check uh, if the staff is uh, in capacity to realize the DUS observation. And um, breeder must show their varieties in the, the same years than Jeves with the same seed sample uh, in the location accredited and declared in the administrative file. The breeder must also sound example varieties, respect the minimum um, number of plants required by uh, international protocol, carry out description of the variety according uh, CPVO uh, protocol, um, description carried out by the performed um, performed by trained and accredited staff. Uh, the breeder must also identify the plant of type. Uh, it must record uniformity observation uh, and all data uh, observed by breeder uh, can give uh, breeder can give result to GVS when GVS recreates the data. And the breeder can also show the most similar peers or varieties stated in the application for distinctness, and it also uh, records the observation and uh, give data uh, to GVS if it's necessary. Uh, next slide, please. Um, GVS have a supervision of the BPS uh, system, so we carry out uh, control at different steps. Uh, and to uh, make control, we have a group, an official group name in French, in French Commission Habilitation uh, DOS May. So it's a group with uh, neutral uh, people. Uh, in RAE, it's scientific uh, people. Uh, SOC, it's uh, people who make certification of seed and JVS members. So officially appointed and notified to the French Ministry of Agriculture, and the group is led by Jeves. The main task of the group are to accredited company. Uh, so we check the existence of the nursery and uh, if uh, staff is certified. We uh, realize the official control um, in, uh, in the field by visiting application location each year to check the protocol request, variety sound, number of plants. So we, we go uh, in the trial of the um, uh, applicant to check all points. And we organize a technical exam to accredit it with our staff to carry out description and uniformity observation. Uh, for example, uh, since the five year last years, we accredited uh, three. Uh, um, uh, we accredited uh, thirty four uh, people, and uh, I, I, I'm the uh, manager of the US test, so I, I carry out also monitoring visits each year um, uh, alone. Uh, to, to check if uh, uh, observation of breeder are uh, agree, are correct. Uh, we can change, please. So it's a um, uh, figures to, to take a summary of the DUS uh, system with BPS. So the first years, we, uh, we have application in February. Uh, we received the seed in March, and uh, now we are uh, we are starting the, the sowing. Uh, sowing are uh, made by Jeves uh, uh, office and also by breeders. So in blue, it's uh, activities carried out by Jeves, and in purple, activities carried out by breeders. So we can look that we make uh, description, infirmity assessment, distinctness assessment in Jeves. Uh, we in GVS uh, trials and also in Buddha uh, trials. 
In JVS, we carry out also uh, other analyses like uh, genotyping in uh, our laboratory. And at the end of the observation, around uh, October, we um, uh, we group all all data. So um, with my team, uh, we make synthesis of data of description made by JVS. We uh, check the distinctness assessment um, by the combination of uh, morphological analysis and genetic distance. So um, I can make a final report at the end of the first year if uniformity, uh, stability, and uh, distinctness uh, are correct. And uh, for example, if uh, I have one uh, problem uh, on uniformity uh, cycle, I can uh, use data from Buddha uh, company. But if at the end of the first year, uh, I have uh, um, a doubt, a doubt on the uh, observation, I continue with the second year. I think that you do not change the slide, but uh, click. Yes, thank you. And in the second year, if it's necessary, uh, only in JVS permits, we uh, sowing second year the varieties to continue the observation and to make a final report. And to finish, next slide. So in conclusion, uh, make a decision is possible at the end of the first years of the DOS exam. After two growing cycle by JVS and one growing cycle uh, of BPS, uh, under the following condition, results of JVS are always used to decide on D, U, and S and for official description. And results of BPS are used carefully. So often they are not used for uh, official deci decision as JVS produce enough data. But in some case, results can be used to back up the decision. So uh, BPS is used to secure and accelerate the US exam, not to replace official cycle carried by JVS. If no final decision taken at the end of the first year, or where any doubt exists, a second year of test is needed only in JVS permits. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valéry. We continue on to our third guest speaker from Japan, Mr. Yoshiyuki Ono. Ono-san, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I, uh, my name is uh, Yoshiki Ono uh, from uh, Japanese PVP office. So today uh, I would like to explain about uh, uh, involving breeders in US testing in Japan. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, legal basis. Next, please. So here we have the Yukov Convention. So uh, this article already uh, explained uh, explained from the uh, Mr. Leontino Tabela uh, office. Uh, I would like to uh, explain again uh, Article 12 of the Epoch Convention. Uh, the uh, Article 12 said that uh, authority uh, may cause the growing uh, growing of the variety or the uh, carry, carrying out of as an study test. So next slide, please. So here we have the uh, uh, Japan Plant Variety Protection and Seed Act, uh, the uh, paragraph, paragraph uh, second, uh, Article 15 said that uh, Minister of MAF uh, carried out uh, on site inspection uh, or growing test. So, uh, EPOF Convention and uh, Japanese PVP Act uh, prescribed the examination for the applied variety. Next, please. So today, sorry, uh, go back to the previous slide. Yes, uh, so today I would like to uh, uh, introduce about the following uh, examination method of Japan. Uh, one is the uh, on-site inspections, uh, other one is the growing test. Next, please. 
So the uh, DUS uh, growing test. So uh, DUS growing test is uh, a fundamental method of the examination because uh, it can be observed characteristics uh, during the growing period and minimizing the uh, influence of the annual fluctuations and the regional fluctuations. Uh, so the uh, most accurate result can, uh, could be obtained. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some plant species, uh, the US growing test, are difficult to conduct due to uh, some issue with uh, uh, human resource uh, or uh, facility resource, uh, depending on the type of the plant species. Next, please. So on-site inspection. So we have the on-site inspections. So on-site inspection is a method in which uh, applicants uh, grow the application variety and the similar variety uh, under the same condition uh, using the uh, methods prescribed in uh, test guideline. Uh, and uh, the examiner visit the applicant's field uh, to conduct the uh, uh, on-site inspection observation. Next, please. Uh, here we have the uh, table of examination uh, compared with uh, key factors. Uh, you can see a column of uh, on-site inspections. Uh, applicants uh, or breeders uh, may perform uh, cultivation and uh, preparation uh, of the plant material. Uh, other key factor uh, should be controlled and responsible for by uh, MAF. Uh, or NCSS. Next slide, please. So uh, I would like to explain about the uh, preparation uh, of the uh, on-site inspection. So uh, the examiner uh, uh, check uh, and uh, make consultation with uh, applicants for, uh, for uh, conduct on-site inspections. Uh, so uh, we check the uh, organization, organization or individuals. And uh, also we check the uh, responsible person and uh, implementation structure. And uh, we uh, ask, uh, we check the uh, uh, expected observation day and place and uh, growing schedule. Next, please. So uh, uh, here we have the uh, uh, conduct on-site inspection at uh, applicant's field. Uh, so examiner uh, visit applicant's field. Uh, the first, uh, we check the uh, uh, variety, uh, which variety is uh, application variety or uh, similar variety. And also we check the uh, number of the plants uh, and the growing condition and uh, uniformity. So that uh, we also uh, uh, select the uh, observation samples uh, to make the uh, uh, um, uh, measurement or observation. And also uh, we take photo to check the uh, uh, environment, uh, mainly brightness and uh, uh, greenhouse or outdoor or uh, uh, subject to condition. Next, so uh, conduct on-site inspection at uh, applicant's field. So we uh, ask the uh, applicant uh, uh, some, uh, some questions. Uh, the first, uh, we ask the uh, breeding method uh, to the breeders, uh, for example, uh, uh, cross breeding or mutation uh, or uh, discovery or others. And also we, we ask to the breeder uh, breeding process. And also uh, uh, we ask the uh, propagation method uh, and growing condition. The last one is a uh, history of uh, material transport. So we have to uh, uh, check again the uh, novelty, uh, novelty check. Next to that slide, please. So, uh, this slide shows uh, being able to uh, choose the examination method uh, 
uh, case by case. So it is needed to conduct uh, DUS examination uh, under the uh, suitable growing condition. However, uh, suitable growing conditions are sometimes uh, different each application variety. The first case, uh, some plant species have uh, strong dependency on particular region uh, and don't perform uh, sufficient expression of the characteristic at our US testing center. For example, rice, wheat, soybean. Uh, second one is uh, some plant species that need to specific facilities and uh, technologies. For example, mushroom or seaweed. Uh, and uh, third one is uh, some plant species need to large number of the personnel and large area for the maintenance of the root stock uh, and the example varieties, so, uh, which are uh, difficult to preserve for the, a long time uh, in the, our previous testing center. Uh, fourth one is uh, uh, if we have the other research center with the high level knowledge uh, for the uh, particular plant, and that research center uh, possible to ensure the uh, confidentiality of the uh, information, information of the application variety, uh, which are considered uh, efficient for the interest DUS testing. Next one, please. So this is uh, our conclusion. So uh, we have to keep balance between the uh, uh, several matters on the uh, uh, PVP system. Uh, uh, for example, uh, guarantee a stable operation or management for the PVP system. Uh, and also, we have to consider the agriculture policy. Uh, and so, uh, we have to keep uh, quality of the examination. On the other, other hand, we have to some uh, other issue, uh, workload, for uh, time and effort and cost. So we, uh, uh, Japanese uh, PVP uh, DUS examination uh, 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 keep the uh, uh, G balance for the, uh, our uh, DUS uh, examination system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ono-san. We will continue now to our fourth guest speaker from New Zealand, Mr. Chris Barnaby. Please, Chris, you, you have the floor. Okay, we've, had, we've got a change from last night. We've got um, us for the screen to change. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, my name is Chris Barnaby. I'm the uh, I run the Plant Variety Rights Office in New Zealand, which is part of the Intellectual Property Office of New Zealand. Um, to give some context of our size and scale, we have around 100 to 110 applications per year, and we have an office. There are four examiners and myself um, provide the the people uh, support. So next slide, please. <clears throat> now this one we've seen before. Um, I have to acknowledge, as we have an IP organization, I have to acknowledge the copyright of um, this is Lee Tino's side slide. Um, I think that it is a really important one, and this is why I have included it in my presentation, um, because often there's a lot of uh, discussion about um, how breeders fit into um, examination or, or more probably in testing. Um, and, it, and it really is um, important to, um, as we've heard from the previous speakers, that it's the authority that manages the whole exercise and it is the authority that actually makes the last decision. Um, often who carries out um, actual DUS testing around collection of data observations, um, drafting uh, descriptions, um, I think is, 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 is an open area of, of um, possibilities. 
um, depending on the situation in a particular country and the resources that are available. Next size, please. Now, we have um, five different ways that we organize testing. Um, and we, of, and of those, <coughs> three of them, <coughs> excuse me, three of them uh, are directly involved with breeder. Now, the decision which testing arrangement is made by the office, and it's based on uh, the plant species and the resources required for the growing trial. Um, the first one we have is central testing by the authority. That is where the office takes responsibility for the growing trial and, and all elements of testing. Um, in our case, we use this for um, a number of agricultural crops um, and is in, a, in an essence uh, very similar to what you see in, in, uh, in Europe, for example. Our second um, possibility um, does involve the breeder. Um, it's central testing by authorized organization or um, research institute. Now, in this case, often the um, industry organization or, or a breeder in that organization has made the application or possibly um, the research institute itself. Um, they undergo uh, training to carry out um, DUS uh, testing work, uh, making observations, collecting data. Now, the advantage is often that uh, a research institute or an organization um, may well have a variety collection. They may well have other uh, resources that are necessary for, for examination that the office does not have. And in our case, species such as apple, pear, cherry, apricot, avocado, and an avocado would be in, in, this, in this category. The third one, which um, I think um, the previous speaker, my, my Japanese colleague, has explained probably um, in, in much more detail um, than, than I can, um, is testing on a breeder's property by the authority, um, which is often, um, as you've heard, is referred to as on-site inspection. Now, in, in our case, um, the responsibility for growing the trial rests with the breeder, the applicant, or someone that they have designated to do this. Um, the growing trial is entirely their responsibility. However, what is in the growing trial, as in the um, similar varieties and all those requirements, uh, are provided by the authority. So the trial design comes from the authority. The examiners um, will take uh, responsibility for all um, observations in data collection and drafting the description. Or in some cases, um, uh, we use uh, what's called a regional describer, um, which is employed um, by the office. And it's uh, we have six of these across New Zealand and they're regionally based. And this does um, reduces the amount of domestic travel that an examiner has to make. Um, for species in this group, it's um, mostly ornamentals, um, some fruit, uh, and, and also in uh, vegetables. The fourth category is testing on a breeder's property by the breeder. Um, this is much closer to um, our uh, the first presentation, uh, Edwina from Australia, where the breeder is responsible for uh, growing the trial and also for um, collecting the information. Uh, in our case, the breeder would have been advised what to put in the trial, the trial design. They are supplied with the, um, the description, um, the test guideline. All the information is supplied to the breeder, and then that is checked um, at some point during the, the, the process as well. Um, but certainly the, the breeder takes the, the um, it's their responsibility to provide all this information to, to the office. Um, species in this category would be um, mainly vegetables, um, perhaps um, some of the smaller minor crops, 
ones that we have relatively infrequent applications or, or little bit little experience. Of course, the last option, which um, may involve the breeder, um, when you think about it, depending on which country it comes from, is um, the use of uh, foreign test reports. Uh, next slide, please. Again, um, I have, <laughs> I have to acknowledge Leontino. Uh, the slide, again, I think is, is very um, uh, to the point and very useful. It has been modified slightly, but again, I acknowledge the copyright. Um, the benefits of cooperating with breeders, as we've heard um, from, from previous speakers, really is about um, using available information. Um, it can make things quicker. Um, it uses breeders' specialist resources, and that has also been referred to um, with respect to the on-site inspection with interesting uh, species such as mushrooms. Um, and for us in the future, we have recently amended um, uh, our law and we now include algae. So possibly in the future, we will have to look at how we DUS test algae, which most likely will involve um, breeders' premises and breeders' expertise. And the, the skills and expertise of breeders is invaluable. They know how to grow crops um, and in many cases, they would probably know a lot more about the varieties than, uh, than elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you for this relatively um, brief introduction to how we involve the breeder um, in New Zealand. We have somewhat of a confusing system. Uh, we cover a whole range of options that exist throughout the UPOL family. Um, right from full central testing at one end and right through to full beta testing at the other and a range of options in between. So thank you very much. Now, sorry, I'll stop sharing for a minute. We'll go on to our first presenter in a minute. And we would like to invite from Argentina, Mr. Alberto Ballesteros, Thank you very much, Lantino. Thank you very much to the UPOF office. It's always a pleasure to cooperate with such a, uh, such a institution that works very well and help us to complete our job. Um, this presentation is going to be a little bit longer than I did it yesterday and I used to do but I, it's needed because I want you to understand a bit how is the system that we work in order to understand why it is such a, why we need a cooperation and why we are very together with the breeders. Uh, breeders actually are part of the, of the system. A system that is complete uh, with the institute that, I, that is the task is carry on and is held by a national seed commission that has uh, technical expert committees. But those technical expert committees mostly are filled with breeders. So uh, we not only are together with the breeders in case that when he is an applicant for a, present, a new presentation, if not, with the breeder when he is part of the committee. So we have a lot of committees, for example, for soybean, for rice, for sunflowers, for cotton, from wheat, from barley, so for forage, for um, horticultural or vegetables or fruits. So it means that uh, that's, that's the breeders Work with the breeder is very important for us. And the system, the Argentina system that it works in Argentina is based on the breeders more than, than the authority. The breeder has to present a series of formal uh, documents in order to start the, the, um, the, the system works. 
and need to require that several documents to be complete. The office is in contact with the breeder to give and receive help in the process of planting the property type. Next, please. Thanks. Um, the files basically contain all the information that we require in order to carry on the, uh, the granted for to grant the title, the title. First of all, the applicant. We are very um, strict on that. We do a lot of research on that. A variety description, like a test guideline, basically. A purity maintenance process that will last the 20 years that we grant the, uh, the property. The breeding history and origin that is very important for performing the US tests, especially the homogeneity and the stability. And it's very important, for example, in forage plants. And if it's GMO or, or not, that is simple. If it's GMO, they have to say um, the event that is, uh, that is on, on, the, uh, on the variety. And then any other useful information that the breeders want to um, put on to uh, make more uh, comprehensive uh, their, their documents. The, the test guideline, as, as it is in, in UPOF, require a complete information, but based in morphological, physiological, phenological uh, characteristics, statistical sometimes, and biochemical characteristics sometimes when it's required, we asked for, and the form has it on it. And the test guidelines, we do like we do usually in the uh, TWU the technical working parties, we, we do a revision of the test guidelines. So we invite the breeders for uh, to take out some characteristics or incorporate another characteristics because we base in their experience and their experience not only how they've been working with the variety, if not how he could um, uh, be sure that his variety is his variety because through his to the, the to the characteristics. Next, please. Breeding history, as I told you before, is very essential to correctly establish the variety purity and uh, to complete the US, uh, the homogeneity and stability and the differentiation process. But it's very important, for example, in um, in a cross-pollinated varieties, for example, the, the forage uh, species, especially when is there are um, species that, are, for example, they um, they be made uh, they breeding um, as a special breeding, like uh, cannot recall the name, but now, um, well, the um, the cross-pollinated varieties are more difficult to uh, do a DOS test. So the uh, uh, forage committee for us is very essential to work with. And of course, the, uh, the uh, self-pollinated varieties are a little bit more easy, but still we need a committee formed by the breeders to help us to get through, to store or see all the uh, information that the breeders or the applicants um, uh, state on the documents. We are facing now new, um, new, new systems like uh, new breeding techniques, GMOs, anterculture to obtain haploids and doubly haploids, and others that make our the office, my work, more complex, more complex and challenging. Every every year, so that's uh, when whenever we have those uh, presentations, for example, the anterculture, the a variety that has been obtained by anterculture, uh, we require uh, information, but we um, require the uh, the overview of the committee to see if the presentation is uh, is is being done. Um, Correctly. Next, I, thanks. The description is a pressure to maintain the variety 
purity is important and varies from species to species, and for this reason, it's extremely necessary that is described it in detail and correctly. We uh, put a lot of pressure on that, and we require maybe many times to review the documents. Next, please. The variety of us work together, as I told you before, with committee of experts in different species, cereal, forage, rice, cotton, soybean, potatoes, and vegetables. The aids uh, for these committees to help study and submit the forms and make recommendation to a grant the property type. But in case of DAB, that in case that the committee say one thing and we uh, think that is have to be thinking in another way, the authorities always prevail. That is very important in case of dispute, or we never have a dispute, but in case of different point of view, uh, the authority point of view prevails. Next, please. Well, as I told you before, Argentina works in the breeders-based testing system that do not require that the authority grow the variety prior to a granted the breeder's right, except if the, uh, we cannot perform a US test with the document on the information that he provided. Um, so in case of that, we require more information and we still have a few varieties, very similar variety that we cannot uh, distinguish and the authority or, and the committee, for example, um, it's think um, uh, in the same way that we think that it's very difficult to distinguish the variety. We do a special test and we plan the variety and we take information from that test and decision is made on the test, on the information of that special test. The special test could last one year in different location, many uh, two years in different location, I'm sorry, three years in one location or two years in different location. Next, please. Breeders uh, have to address many requirements for many uh, uh, state office. So that is important for, we, we have that in mind. So we want to help the breeders when we work with us to make uh, the everything more easy for, for him. The VP office is in contact to help with everything they need and we have no distance with them. We always call them, they have our uh, mail, even our WhatsApp, and we are always in contact with them. We explain how to present information, even the statistical, biochemi biochemical, or other items that they probably do not, don't understand very well how to present it, we help them. If they call us, we, we, we explain it. They are informed if they have to present incomplete or wrong information, or description in the genetic origin, the breeding history, or whatever. They are invited to committee meetings where the cultivar are discussed and how to present other useful information in case of, uh, in case to be pertinent. Next, next, please. From time to time, we organize courses on how to correct present the documentation, in particular for forage species, and they are the most allogamous and might present incomplete information or error in the description and the genetic origin of reading history. It's very difficult, especially uh, and the um, and the, the 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 new the new species, or when they work with the species, very difficult to. Um, uh, to complete the forms like uh, footballs or courts or, uh, or gardens or, 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 or that, that species are very difficult. So we help them very much. When the desk group form is reviewed, breeders are notified so that they can make their contribution based on their experience in the use. As I told you before, we gather them time by time and we discuss the test guidelines if they have to be reviewed to add any other characteristics or to uh, take off any characteristics. Next, please. For example, um, 
with rice, cotton, and soybean, we work very close together with the breeders in order to um, genotype all the, all the varieties. With the breeder, we choose uh, which tests should we carry on, which lab, how, and, and they help us in everything, how to pay, how to, for example, if, it's, if we do the test, outside Argentina have to be done. So they help us in everything and all that um, expertise that they have that we don't have. So they collaborate with us. In soybean, for example, the application of the post model combining genotype and genetic testing has been so successful to drastically reducing the number of variety pairs to evaluate in the fields around 55%. So, Genotype, to work with them, we propose to genotype the varieties. They are uh, in doubt uh, if that system worked. We finally convinced them, they work with us. We did it in soybean, we did the, uh, the genotype. We then uh, used the Gaia system and they, it's been very successful. So as you see, it's 50% less in variety, most similar varieties, and the time. Now we require one year when we require three years. The breeder contributed the experience in labs to carry on the genotype and best way to send samples, payment, and study the results, agreement of interpretation, the results, and others. We use the experience to do in other crops. The experience that we take in, a, in one crop, we take it to the other crop and etc. So as you see, is constantly, we work constantly with the breeders. Next time, next please. In wheat and barley breeders have decided to use the optical market. For example, in wheat and barley, um, we propose them to genotype their variety to, um, to carry on the new states much easily much faster and much confident and, and much uh, confident way but they decide that is uh, they didn't want to so it was to perform by by ourselves it would be very costly and very difficult so we do not use the the, the we are not using no, we are not using the uh, the uh, genotype and the genotype for uh, for uh, the um, for the US test, but they decided to be uh, to work with the optical markers and artificial intelligence. They decided that it's more effective in identifying the variety and establish the purity of the samples. We are not using that in the US. I want to uh, you be uh, I want to do this clear, very clear. We don't use the um, um, optical markers or intelligent or artificial intelligence to do the US test. We use it for the uh, enforce the law for uh, marketing purposes. But we're starting to study how to use to do it in the US test. So we established um, a special committee to, uh, um, to produce some tests and see how the things will work. Optical markers are novel tools and require images for different years and location to capture all possible variation in the interaction of the genotype with the environment. It has begun to be used in control trade and this is study for use to aid in the US. Next, please. As I've seen, the, um, the office working in conjunction with the breeders in many aspects, the committee of expert our breeders and research to their help is invaluable, invaluable as at the UPO office. So we are taking help not only for the breeders, it's not for the UPO office, it's because you, UPO has developed an enormous library on all topics related with granting and defending the, uh, the property. The committee of the expert of the country hold a meeting, has a statistical, biochemical, botanical information, many other specific ones to complete to work the grants report with the title. And it's important to enable the PVP office to illustrate and help the breeder efficiently so they can marker the variety 
so they know that the title is endorsements to their trade. So we help the breeders how to um, overview or, or to work with the UPOF documents sometimes. Uh, if they need some information, we provide it. And we know that UPOF has already uh, been working on that, um, uh, on that matter, for example, in the statistics, which is very important. Next, please. Well, I think there is the last one. Well, thanks very much. I'm open to any questions. I hope I was clear to explain everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. We will keep the questions towards the, the end of our session. We have one more presentation and then we will take questions. But thank you very much for the presentation. We will continue the program now with our second guest speaker from Canada, Ms. Ashley Balchin. Ashley, you have the floor, please. And I'll be advancing the slides, so just please let me know. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Leontino. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ashley Balchin. I am a senior examiner with the Canadian Plant Breeders Rights Office. Uh, I've been asked to speak to you today a little bit about uh, how we interact with breeders and DUS testing in Canada. Next slide, please. So here's a bit of an overview of what I will discuss today. So very briefly, I'll explain how our system works in Canada. Um, and then uh, quickly, I'll go through uh, the application part of the phase and how we involve breeders in that part of the process. And then I'll spend a bit more time on the examination phase and also highlight some other areas where we involve uh, breeders in our work. Uh, and then I'll make some concluding statements. So to begin with, let me, introduce our office and, and explain a little bit there. Uh, Canada, Canada has had uh, plant breeders rights legislation in effect uh, since 1990. We received our first applications in 1992 for a select few crops uh, and by 1998 we had opened it to accepting applications for all plant species with the exception of algae, fungi and bacteria. And in February of 2015, Canada's Plant Breeders Rights Act was amended to conform with the UPOV 91 Convention. So the Canadian Plant Breeders Rights Act is administered by the Plant Breeders Rights Office, which is within the Canadian Food Inspection Agency of the Canadian government. We're located in Ottawa, you can see there with the arrow, that's where we're located in the province of Ontario. And we're a small group, we have a staff of nine people, and you can see on the screen there uh, what our breakdown is. Next, please. So Canada is a breeder testing authority. Um, and the main reason we were established in this way be was because of our large geographic area that we cover. Uh, there's multiple climatic zones across Canada. And this is really conducive to breeder testing, we find. Uh, it allows the plants to be grown either where they're developed in the country or else where they may be um, have the optimal growth. Uh, so that's one reason. It was also, uh, it's also a slightly more cost effective way of implementing a UPOV DUS system. So that was a, a desirable characteristic for us. And to be clear, we have no growing facilities that are maintained by the Plant Breeders Rights Office. Uh, there is no material, plant material sent to our office uh, for the purposes of growing DUS trials. We do require that seed samples are submitted uh, for any seed reproduced varieties, but this is stored as a reference sample only uh, in long-term storage, and it's only used in the event of a grow out needed later on. It's not used for the purpose of a comparative trial. So DUS trials are grown at the breeder premise or uh, often in there's the case where it's at a designated trial coordinator's uh, growing site. It's a very collaborative process uh, working with breeders. They're involved uh, throughout the application and examination uh, process. Next slide, please. So how does this work for us uh, in Canada? Um, and we use this diagram to sort of, to explain how we, how we function. Um, at the top, we have the national authority, which is the Plant Breeders Rights Office. We ensure that all testing and data submission is done in accordance with UPOV standards and we grant rights based on our national legislation. 
in combination with that, we have uh, breeder cooperation. Uh, so the breeder does the testing of the variety and it's verified by the authority, us, uh, through an examination of the trials. The breeder collects the data, the breeder submits the data to the national authority. We also have an element of public disclosure in Canada. So what that means is we as an authority, we disclose a summary of the description of the varieties to the public. And we do this uh, in the way of a, we have a quarterly publication on our website and it's called the Plant Varieties Journal. So the results of the trials are highlighted in this publication uh, with a description of the variety. To be clear, we, we don't publish on our website the DUS report. It's simply a summary of the results of the trial. We essentially publish enough information or a summary of the information so that the public can be informed and uh, scrutinize the information. The public then has six months to object to the contents of the application or the results of the trial. So this combination of these three components is how, we, how it functions in Canada, and it's the foundation for our breeder testing system. Next slide, please. So to begin with, the first stage, of course, is, uh, is in protecting a variety is the application phase. So very quickly here on the screen, there's some, some of the responsibilities of the applicant or, or the breeder. Um, but maybe I'll just highlight that this is where there's an initial uh, selection of the reference varieties that will be used in the comparative trial. This first uh, selection of reference varieties is uh, provided by the breeders uh, to our office. Next, please. So once the application is received, here are some of the responsibilities then uh, of the Plant Breeders Rights Office in response to that submission. So we provide a lot of guidance and a lot of uh, back and forth with the applicant, breeder, trial coordinator, um, whoever is uh, uh, communicating with us. Um, the main communications are regarding the next steps. So what deadlines need to be respected and what the expectations are for those next steps. We will provide them with protocols for conducting DOS trials. We'll indicate which test guidelines need to be completed. And we'll also, this is our first opportunity to uh, provide feedback on their reference ready selection. Maybe we're highlighting the grouping characteristics, maybe we're um, providing other criteria that maybe need to be considered. Um, so depending on how familiar our applicant or our breeder is with conducting DOS testing, uh, there's more or less guidance provided in this case. Next, please. The next step uh, is the examination phase. Uh, so the breeder trial coordinator will signal to us uh, which in what year they wish to uh, get an examination conducted on their trials. They'll do this by paying the fee and submitting a request form to our office. And in that request form, they will indicate to us when they would like us to visit. Our recommendation is always uh, to have us invite us to come visit their trials when uh, the most distinguishing characteristics are visible. So this takes a lot of communication uh, between the breeder and, uh, and our office. Uh, we ask that uh, they keep in touch with us regularly throughout that growing season. The communication needs to be continuous uh, in an examination year um, so that we are kept up to date on the status of the plants, either um, updates on their health, if there's anything that could be affecting the trial in that way, the development uh, in particular, if they're progressing slower than expected or more quickly, so that we try and time our visit for that optimal time. It's also expected that the breeder or trial coordinator begins completing the test guidelines. And that, uh, and that by the end of the DOS trial, that the breeder has submitted the complete variety description which is the completed test guideline to our office. And they also submit some comparative photographs as well. Coordination, like I said, is uh, with the Plant Breeders Rights Office is really key uh, throughout the growing season. Next, please. An examiner from the PBR office visits all trials grown in Canada to ensure that they are conducted properly. They're grown in accordance with UPOV standards and that the new varieties are distinct, uniform, and stable. On average in Canada, we conduct uh, 250 to 300 examinations a year, and this is all across the country. 
Uh, during our visit to the trial, an examiner will take uh, key observations on the distinguishing characteristics and other required characteristics as well. We really focus our time on maybe the fruit, the flowers, the seed pods, uh, those more maybe, if I can say, important characteristics for distinguishing the variety. Next, please. So now we get to the part of the trial where the trial is completed, but we still consider ourselves in the examination phase uh, because we have not granted rights on this varieties yet. So to recap, um, on the left, you'll see a list of um, the tasks that are completed by the breeder or trial coordinator. So they've completed the test guideline, including the table of characteristics and summarize the distinguishing characteristics. They're providing us with a photograph of the candidate and reference varieties. Ideally, they show the differences in the, in the frame and, and they're both in the same shot. They also provide us with more details uh, regarding how the trial was grown um, and the condition of the plants. So they provide a full uh, description there. So in reaction to this, the PBR office uh, will compare those results submitted with our examination notes that we took in the field on site, and we'll compare that with what the breeder has submitted. A PBR examiner will draft a description, so summarize the results of uh, the data that was submitted, and we'll publish this in the Plant Varieties Journal on the website. This is based exclusively on the data submitted by the breeder. If all goes well, the variety is granted rights uh, after six months with no objections being received. Next, please. Next. So there's a few other ways that we uh, coordinate with uh, breeders uh, regarding DUS examinations, um, but not maybe associated with specific applications. Um, so when test guidelines are under review uh, within UPOV, if we have Canadian breeders uh, in the country that are developing varieties, we will often consult with them on the drafts and get their opinions uh, as far as uh, whether it's working for them. So an example of this is the cannabis test guideline is currently under review within UPOV. So we have many private sector breeding companies uh, within Canada that are actively developing new varieties. So we have ongoing discussions with them at the moment uh, with sharing the, the discussions in the subgroups in our development of the test guideline to ensure it's relevant to them, to the sector, to the varieties that are being developed here in Canada. Uh, another way sort of close to that, uh, that we ask sometimes for breeder or trial coordinator uh, cooperation is, Maybe we don't have a breeder in, in the country, but maybe we're getting lots of applications and it's still a crop that's of interest to Canada. So we would approach a trial coordinator or a breeder uh, who is growing trials for a crop uh, if they would source more material for us. And often they're very willing to do that. Um, so they may uh, source more varieties for us so that us as an office, if we're participating in a subgroup discussion for the development of a new test guideline or a revision, that when we go out to conduct our examination, we have more than the minimum uh, for varieties to look at. This really helps us because we don't have growing facilities, so it's difficult sometimes to uh, get a wide range of varieties uh, present at a given time. Uh, so this really helps us participate more fully in the this development of test guidelines. So, Sort of a concluding statements here. Having a breeder testing system we find is really naturally conducive to a high level of cooperation with breeders. Uh, the peer review process uh, ensures transparency and accountability within the sector. In the end, we find that by involving breeders, there's, there's investment by both the breeders and the PBR office in ensuring uh, strong protection for varieties. That's all for me for today. Um, Thank you very much. And I would welcome any questions. And you're also welcome to reach out to me uh, at my email below if you ever have any follow-up questions. Thank you.